Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinga, and this episode number 359. That's tres cinco nueve. How you guys doing? How you guys feeling? It's me, your host, Agassino Zinga. Hope you're fine. Hope you're well. How am I? Thank you for asking. Pretty good. Um, had a pretty quiet weekend for the most part, but you know, we'll get into that later on in the show. But if it's your first time watching and you like what you hear, you like what you see, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, support the show via Patreon, click the link down below, patreon.com forward slash Agostino, that's patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O for a little as $1 a month or £1.20 a month, depending on where you're located. You can support the show, get access to my audio podcast in four before it comes out anywhere else and a few other bits and bobs I'm going to add as we go along. So make sure you check out the Patreon down below, patreon.com forward slash Agostino. Yes, um, well, how's my weekend? Pretty calm, man, pretty calm, pretty quiet. Um, again, not much to do, uh, didn't go out, uh, spent most of my time in the gym, to be honest. Um, went to a gym twice, actually, just to kind of, you know, um, increase my daily output. Read a couple of books, watched a couple of films, watched Taken, actually. I watched Gravity with Sandra Bullock and... Uh, George Clooney, which was pretty trash. Um, I'm a big, sci- I'm a big fan of sci-fi. I'm a big space adventurer sort of movie guy. I love movies about people going to the moon, to Mars. You know, Martian was probably one of my favorite movies. Uh, I've watched maybe in that genre. So I kind of try and give every, whatever, whichever of those movies come out, I just give them a chance just because for the sake of it. But Gravity was pretty terrible. <coughs> that has to be said, very very terrible. And it's something that, I don't know, maybe Sandra Bullock herself, maybe it's her personality in the way she acts, but I hate that she always kind of, um, not hate, but she's very good at kind of playing that kind of, um, not damsel in distress, but you know that lady that always kind of needs help and assistance in the movie? And, you know, they can't, it's like, it, it, Sandra Bullock kind of plays like the lady that you'd always be, ang- Sandra Bullock plays the lady that you might be friends with, who always asks you questions, cause that, but can never Google stuff. They kind of always want an explanation about how to do things in person or over text or over the phone, whereas they could just get the answer via Google, right? You know those kind of people that overly, overly rely on their friends helping them out to do sort, sort things out, to do this, do that. She kind of has that kind of vibe about her in movies or she just kind of is just so emotionally draining, I think, as an actress or as a person, as a character she plays. Maybe that's her, a special power. There's always something that you need to kind of give her attention, look after her, give her guidance. It's like, God almighty, man, figure it out. And I guess Gravity is a good example of it, isn't it? If you have if you watch a movie, you know what I mean. Like, it's like, come on, man, you're in space, man. You should know something. Like, God damn it. She's in there. She's up in space acting like an intern. It's like annoying. So, yeah, I watched that. Then I watched Taken. Taken was interesting because it, 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 it reminded me of that kind of, um, not reminding, it, it's not, when, when, I don't, what do you call it? Street smart? It's funny to say it's white privilege, right? The the humorous thing to be would be said like the original Taken, the girl that gets taken in the, when she goes to when they go to Paris apartment with her friends, it's you know it's um it's the textbook white privilege, right? That you could go to a foreign country, and be so cavalier with where you're staying that you would op- that you would willingly jump into a cab of a stranger, um up until jump in the cab of a stranger to your new place that you're staying in in a foreign country, and then tell him exactly where you live. And tell him to come and buy and pick you up later. Like that is white privilege, and you know, in in its very essence. But that's not the funny thing. That's that's how to make it humorous. But the actual reality of it is like God Almighty, man. Like I think that kind of level of like carelessness makes sense when you go to like maybe maybe for me, yeah, maybe that's not even a good idea. I'd say it makes sense when you go to South America. When I went to Central America, Nicaragua, that was sort of like how you had an an a fun adventure, right? You kind of leave yourself open to having adventures via the amount of people that you just spoke to randomly in a bar, um, at a street market, um, at a little rave you went to in, at the beach, right? That's how you just open yourself up to adventures. Like the more conversations you had, the more random encounters, the more likely you'd have a better time. Um, and of course, it's different for me because I'm a dude. I can handle myself. It's unlikely that someone's going to want to, um, you know, grab me up in my hostel and somehow, you know, sell me for human body parts or something you know or maybe sell me on a sex trade it's not really something that's going to happen in my reality but that's where you'd probably would do that but i think any if i was to go somewhere in europe as if i'm going to tell anybody any information about where i'm staying 
as if I'm going to be open and willing to kind of be sharing every single detail of my life with some strangers. It doesn't make any sense. Um, that's what I kind of gained from that one. And of course, you know, the vengeful nature of, um, what's his name? Liam Nielsen's character going around the world and essentially burning everything to the ground in the hopes of bringing back his daughter who he kind of missed out. Because I, I forgot that part. I didn't remember in Taken that the reason why he's so like determined to get his daughter back apart from it being his daughter is the fact that he feels guilty that he'd been away um, and hadn't really seen her grow up. He missed loads of parts of her, you know, um, maturity as a young lady. He doesn't even know that she's into art or that she likes boys or blah, 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 blah. So he's kind of, he's trying to um, make up for lost time. And obviously once he sees a moment to kind of step up as a dad and kind of show off all the tricks that he's learned in his um, career that he doesn't really specify what it was. Maybe he was a um, special forces, maybe he was a spy or whatever. When he gets opportunity to, to kind of like pay it back and say, hey, the, the time that I was away, it was useful because I've gained these skills, a very special set of skills, as he says in the movie, right? That I'm going to use to kind of get you back, my daughter. So that was interesting. And then, of course, the most um, press, uh, the most um, important thing that we did over the weekend was watch Bayern Munich beat Paris Saint Germain 1 0 Champions League final. And it got me sad, man. It made me really, really, really bloody sad. Um, for all the obvious reasons, isn't it? Like, I'm not sure about you, but like being a sports fan or being a fan or being a yeah, being a football fan at this current moment in time, especially a fan of my club, Manchester United, is very difficult. Um, especially the older you get, because I think when I was younger, I used to get a lot more riled up about the current state of affairs, the fact that we were owned by the Glazers, the fact that we didn't have any kind of football infrastructure that meant that we were trying to take it that we were trying to get back on our mantle and win championships, win European Cups, right? It didn't really seem like we were doing that. We were more operating the, the club as a business, as a way to kind of gain more followers and, and all that sort of stuff around the world. It wasn't really with the intention of, you know, winning stuff on a football pitch. Um, I would get really riled up. I would get really annoyed at our recruitment process, managerial appointments, the infrastructure in the club. All these things would just get me hot and bothered. So much so I'd go and protest. I'd do the whole, you know, um, green and yellow bandanas, um, scarfing, glazer out, Ed Woodward out. But then the older you get, the more apathetic you get in some reg in some regards because you know how long things actually should take or will take, especially in the situation that we're in at the moment. So. No matter of ranting or raving from me as United fans on Twitter or whatever, it's going to change things. And even if they do change, we're not going to see the fruits of that change until, what, maybe five years, right? If we say Solskjaer is the man, which I don't think he is, but let's say he is the man for the moment, and you get the infrastructure right, you get football director in, you change the recruitment process or the recruitment criteria, you get people in behind the scenes to help out with the health and fitness and the um, pre injury prevention, the scouting network changes, all these things that need to be modernized in Man United because they haven't been, even I think the training ground, they said, um, needs, needs a bit, no, sorry, the stadium needs a bit of a lick of paint and an update. You update all these things, there's no guarantees that they're going to be reflective or they're going to be, you're going to see the fruits of the labor on the pitch. And there's no guarantee that the manager or the players are going to deliver. So you're hoping all those things go well. That's minimum five years. A minimum five seasons. Minimum. So, and then you have to account for the fact that you might be wasting time with the person you got at the moment in social or the structure you got at the moment. It might eat, it might kind of add time on to the time that's already set in stone, which is going to take for us to get back to the top. And this match against, you know, again, it, it showed, because it, it, in, in one space, you'd say PSG were probably a bit far a bit behind by munich where they are in terms of as a club and how they kind of go about things but you can tell you know as as um as unethical as the new owners are of psg they've obviously come in with a mandate of trying to win big trophies in order to give them obviously more clout more cachet uh make the club a little bit more appealing obviously sell all those jordans and stuff right but the major thing that they kind of look after is the stuff that goes on the pitch because they're under the uh, they're under the assumptions that if we keep winning all the other stuff is going to come the money the documentaries the movies the jordan collaborations all the trendy social market social media stuff they do that's going to come <coughs> anyway as soon as you keep winning matches so they win matches they win matches um they win their league they win their league cup for the most part all that good stuff all their domestic honors and then obviously the main goal is champions league and they've kind of come further than they've ever come before by coming you know, by ending up in the in the final, and for the most part, playing pretty well against Bayern Munich. So they've they're like a newly formed club, right? They've gone through various stages of ownership, various state phases in terms of their overall development. 
and they've obviously got to this stage but we're man united and we were where we were when Sarah ferguson was there and look how far back we've kind of fallen look how far away we are from the likes of Bayern munich right i think some people on twitter are making jokes about oh um was it Bayern munich won the won the treble this season right they won all the domestic trophies and their league and then they won um sorry they won the domestic trophy the league and they won the champions league so they won the treble and they're already adding to this team by adding Sane. Liverpool finished with 99 points and they're adding players to their team like Thiago. Chelsea finished below us and they've signed five players. Or oh, they're in the process of signing five, right? They've already got two already um, done in Ziyech and Timo Werner. Kai Kervis is coming. Kai Hervis is coming up. Thiago Silva and somebody else. And United, we finished, what, second? What, third, right? Third? Yeah, third. And we haven't signed anybody. So far, we've been linked with some scandinavian youngsters who look pretty good from the stuff i've seen on youtube with highlights but again you can't make a fair assessment on a player due to highlights we've all been burned on that one before remember flipping gabriel Oberton. remember how good he looked on bloody um youtube compilations it's just mad isn't it to think that these all these other clubs some clubs who have kind of again by munich have won the treble and they're adding to their their team already they've already added to it before they've even picked up this trophy and we are where we are and we haven't added anybody you're hearing rumors or murmurs of what's that a famous Edward quote about it being hard to do business during covid about our inability to sign more than two players in one transfer window this idea that we keep going for bricks we keep going for british players so we can look after the culture and the club somehow it makes no sense when you see obviously harry Maguire getting into his kerfuffle in greece whether or not it was for you know um uh uh, whether it was from reasons that were justified still you know he's getting scuff ups in Greece so to so to come to the conclusion that somehow getting British players is going to um, make sure that we end up in a situation where we have too many big egos in our squad in our team or distractions is not a good idea but still we haven't signed anybody so again watching that match was bittersweet man it really was bittersweet again good quality match two really tight two really um, well contested or well coached teams uh, really going you know above and beyond to concert that's what you felt you felt the concentration levels were high right apart from obviously some of the openings that psg had which they would feel like they should have scored from i think and if they would have scored i still think Bayern Munich got a one because i think the game would have opened up more i think psg needed to score first to kind of win the game i think the fact that Bayern Munich scored first and the game opened up and psg were chasing the game there was an opportunity that Bayern Munich to hit them on the counter and you know really take advantage Lewandowski had a couple of good opportunities that he kind of carved himself don't get me wrong but he's always a bit of a goal threat and all the players they have on the pitch but you just you just felt as if like you're watching two really top teams at their pump, right? Really going for it. And it made me wonder, like, bloody hell, from all the teams that got knocked out prior to the final and then thinking about us going next season with the squad that we got at the moment, especially our starting 11, if anyone gets injured, we're completely effed, especially if we're playing, you know, week in, week out. Um, as we are now at the moment, we've got, you know, we're going to have a lot more fixtures with the Champions League in. Uh, obviously, the domestic cups with the leagues. There's no guarantee we're gonna we're gonna have a fully fit squad. It never happens anyway. We're gonna pick up injuries, and the moment we pick up injuries, you start replacing players. Suddenly our quality goes down down the drain. So I don't know, man. Watching that game was really really frustrating. Like just to, just to kind of be like, like, look what we could have, look where we were prior. We were one of these clubs, like f serious football clubs that took football seriously. That wasn't just looking at it as an extension to make money or something, right? Now look at us. We're here trying to scrap for the David Brookses of the world and stuff like absolute madness. But yeah, congratulations to Bayern Munich, I guess, in that regard. I'm um, happy for Hansi Flick. Obviously, um, what you call it? Uh, spare a foot for Nico Kovac, innit? He had the exact, he had this exact same squad. Uh, what finished? I think when he got sacked, they were third or something. They, they I think they lost five 0 to Eintracht Frankfurt or something like that. So they were really in bad form. A lot of the players were kind of, you know, thinking about their future. Jerome Boateng, Thomas Muller were basically told those surplus to requirements. And then Hansi Flick comes in, the assistant coach and says, hey, I know what to do. I can sort this out. Brings all those stalwart players back into the fold, coaches them well. Again, it probably helps that you've got great players who, you know, I don't think that Bayern Munich team, you're not going to get, there's not a lot of players that look like in that Bayern Munich squad that will turn up to training late. Do you know what I mean? They, they look like the kind of players that, you know, go to bed early, eat the right things, you know, don't party too much, train really hard, and are really professional. So I guess it's pretty easy even for an interim coach to come in and do a good job. It kind of reminds me of when um, Avram Grant would take over for Chelsea a couple of times here and there, right? When Chelsea had just a team full of winners and pros, it's easy to come in as an interim coach to kind of, you know, steady the ship. But still, what he done with this Bayern Munich team, 
um, how they play. Again, adding Sane to this side is just insane, especially when, you know, Komen and Perisic are competing for one place. You've got Sane coming in, competing with Nabri. Like, just absolutely madness. Obviously, Noya's suddenly found another gear. He's evolved into, like, he made some big saves. Just, you think to yourself, like, that's what a football team should look like. A serious one. Not like what we look like at the moment. But, you know, what can you do, man? What can you do? Next on the list, next on the list, we have um, some distressing news, actually, I guess, if you're a, some distressing news, if you're a teacher, at, um, or if, you, if you've got kids and you want to send them back, and especially if you're a teacher as well, send them back to school. It's something I've been thinking about a lot lately, especially during COVID, because I don't know, maybe because we're living in weird times where we should have a lot more sympathy for our neighbors, right? We should be a little bit more empathetic. In fact, em- empathetic, 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 emp- emphatic, empathetic. We should be a little bit, whatever that word is, right? Um, about our neighbors, we should kind of have them in the in our thoughts and think about how bad other people are, kind of are uh, what position they're in at the moment, going through COVID nineteen during this pandemic. Um, especially if you have got kids that are of a school age, it must be an absolute nightmare, right? Having to decide whether or not to send them back to school or have them homeschooled still it must be absolutely horrible especially with the conflicting information that's out there, which has kind of been one of the most frustrating things about this whole debacle. There was a real big movement, it felt like, especially, I feel, I think in most Western countries, especially with the um, uprising in populism, it feels like um, there was a bit of an assault on intellectualism and assault on science, right? A lot of people kind of, um, uh, like the anti-vaxxers crowd and all that sort of stuff, right? And um, they had some, there, maybe there were some reasons behind it. There were some actual real concerns, right? If you're, uh, if you're a mother or a father and you've got kids, there are some concerns that you maybe have to um, think about, mull over, Google, do your research about certain vaccines and stuff. But largely, that argument is a bit insane, right? You know, these vaccines have been developed over years and years and years and decades, right? Um, from, you know, some of the best uh, health professionals or doctors in their field, They've essentially saved millions of lives um, over the years as well. They are vital to our survival as a human species, right? Um, but I understand the concerns. Their concerns are valid. But you would imagine, right, as a way to kind of counteract those that concerns, the medical professionals would be robust in their research. They would speak clearly. They would have a way of kind of communicating information that would be digestible for the average everyday folk and they wouldn't be compromised right you wouldn't feel as if like oh this person's speaking this way only because they have these certain interests that they're looking after but covid's completely disproved that right if anything is proved that medical professionals are as corrupted as politicians right you have people like fauci in the united states telling people not to wear a mask and then later on he's going oh no we only said that because we were afraid of the supplies running out so they were always vital in the beginning but they didn't want people to wear them because they didn't want the the supplies to go out so medical professionals wouldn't have them it's like yeah so now if you're a, a parent and the professionals are coming out and telling you, hey, send your kids back to school because it's safe, nothing's, nothing's going to go wrong, you're, you're within your rights to be like, mm, I, I don't believe you, I don't trust you, you're talking out of your ass, I'm going to make my own, my own, own mind up. And I, and I do believe, and I do, I do the sympathy with it as well. And I sympathy for it too on the side of the kid. I can only imagine what it must be like if you're, I think if you're, if you're under the age of 18, you've got to just suck it up, it is what it is. But imagine if you're like in primary school and you have to be at home or even just under year nine. Like imagine how much hell that must be being at home without your friends. Because for sure, if you're at home and your parents are restrict with you, that means your friends are probably going to be strict as well. They're not going to let you come over. No parent is going to want to be the reckless one or the fun one. Not, not in this pandemic. You don't want to be the fun parent in this pandemic. So all the parents are going to be taking precautions. Plus, I'd imagine there's many parents out there that have pre pre-existing conditions right some who are maybe I don't, let's imagine you're disabled as a parent right like that's already a pre-existing condition that i'm sure will make you susceptible to certain things that other people cannot get um or you're um immune indeficient right you or you have autoimmune issues or you're just an older parent in general like come on or you or imagine you're a parent that if you you invite all your family members to your house and stay over during covid because you don't want them to be alone. So you've got like a big house and you have other family members in there who are a bit, you know, who are in that kind of age range where if COVID hits, it's kind of, it's you know, it's a catastrophe. It must be such a hard decision to make. And look at the story from The Guardian. It says 17 teachers at Dundee School contract COVID-19. 17 teachers. And I guess this is, this is the whole issue of it. There was loads of talk 
about oh um how likely it was for a kid to sp- for a kid to be a super spreader basically because kids touch everything right there's no way you can do social distancing in a school there's no way kids are going to remember to not touch their face or not touch certain things or wash their hands consistently it's not going to happen they're children right so the idea is that children are super spreaders right they're going to spread it exponentially more than adults would but the science is telling us hey kids don't give it to adults as frequently adults can't give it to kids if kids get it it's not fatal blah 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 but the evidence there's so many there's so many anecdotal stories of kids i think lately what was it? i read a story about a child that was like six and got covid and passed away or something like that i remember so i think maybe it's the youngest person to have covid and got it now again we don't know this kid could be you know diabetic they could have had many other conditions prior to it it could be obese we have no idea because they don't really the media as well are playing for us are playing us for a bit of a fool as well right they don't tell us about these things they just sensationalize and put these headlines out that get us all scared and afraid now when you read into the story like hold on this person wasn't you know what i mean they weren't even obviously they weren't looking after themselves of course they were they're going to get covid and die do you know what i mean um but yeah this is an article from guardian it says 70 teachers at the dundee school contract covid19 jesus christ it says yeah, um, health officials in Tayside have disclosed that 17 teachers at a special school in Dundee have contracted COVID-19 along with two pupils and three community contacts. When they mean special school, they mean special needs or spe- what's that mean? Um, NHS Tayside shut Kings Park School uh, last Wednesday for deep cleaning after an outbreak emerged and on Friday closed it all to allow staff and pupils to isolate for 14 days because of people's complex needs. Jesus Christ. The board said on Sunday that 20 people infected up to 12 on Friday. It said contact tracing identified the links to two other schools in Dundee with one positive case at St. Peter's and St. Paul's Primary and another at Happy Times Out of School Club in Downtown Primary. Yeah. Actually, think about that because I think they do mean special needs school, right? Or spe- like, imagine if you've got a child now with learning uh, difficulties and you're having to, to, to do homeschooling. Are you insane? Like doing classes on Zoom with a kid that's got like learning difficulties. Like my word. Part of the reason why schools are so important for parents with those kind of children is that it gives you a bit of respite, right? You get the opportunity to kind of put your feet up, relax a little bit, do some cleaning, do some admin around the home. I don't know, get supplies, whatever. Just maybe live your life a little bit, right? You get a little bit of a respite in terms of having to look after your kid all the time who obviously needs your you know undivided attention you can't take your eyes off he or she at all so imagine now like it's just honestly such a tricky position to be in i don't really envy i think again i think everyone needs to if you don't have children of course i I don't but you have to just respect people and let them make whatever decision they they want to make and just you know it's not your business to get involved that's one place i would never tell people what to do like it's just not my place at all but i think that's one place people should definitely you know stick their nose out of because bloody hell man it continues here, it said all pupils in the affected class at St. Peter's and St. Paul's have been asked to stay at home and self isolate. In a further outbreak, two primary school T classes at the High Blantyre Primary School in Lancashire um, have been told to stay at home after the teacher and two people tested positive over the weekend. God almighty. Uh, Dr. Ely Hobbesville, a consultant at the Public Health Medicine at NHS Tyside, said since the identification of positive cases at Kings Park, a detailed contact tracing program has been underway and these linked cases are being identified because those cons- um, concerted efforts of the testing process. Of test and protect yeah that's a good idea i guess you know attack and tracing helps that way because you can identify it quickly so we must do everything we can to protect all our communities against covid19 and that is why we have issued a guidance of self-isolation uh by taking this action we are containing any further spread of infection we know that this may be an anxiety for some parents and children uh but we must do everything we can to ensure we keep people safe the outbreaks are the latest in a series either at or linked to scottish schools since the classes resumed in early august in some cases leading to entire classes being told to remain at home and self-isolate these cases include schools in glasgow perth uh blagarawaya paisley johnston and coatsbridge after weeks of falls, COVID-19 infection rate is climbing again with two large outbreaks involving pub growers in Aberdeen and chicken factory workers in Copper Angus, also in NHS Tayside region. There are 83 new cases detected across Scotland on Sunday and 123 on Saturday, the highest daily figure since mid-May. In July, the number of new cases was regularly as low as between 1 and 4 and day. Uh, there have been no new deaths or confirmed or confirmed COVID nineteen patients since Wednesday. Man, some of this stuff is just like I don't. You, 
sometimes you really do wonder like what these politicians in government get paid to do because part of me thinks like if there was such because again i don't have children so i don't i didn't know this was such an issue about kids having to be in school i didn't i never it never crossed my mind how developmentally important it was to be in school of course i know it having you know been i grew up in a low-income neighborhood you know there's not many things to do school is probably the best thing i had going for me right people would stay in people I remember in my school we stay at school or around the perimeter of our school in our uniforms until maybe like 7 p.m and we went to a pretty trendy secondary school that ended at like five or three right three to five p.m and we'd stay outside for like seven to eight madness right because we had nothing else to do we had especially that time when no one really had any computers at home no one had a sky tv or anything there's nothing to go back home to unless you're going to play football so you just try to stay outside with your friends at school or hang about or stay in the library and use the free internet as much as you could so i and also understand you know all those interactions i had were developmentally probably one of them some of the most important times in my life right interacting with my friends you know gallivanting around growing up as a person blah blah, blah getting involved in all these sticky situations developing my kind of street now all all this sort of good stuff so i never really it never really crossed my mind until this occasion right but if this was the case and everyone knew how important schools were why didn't the government set out a plan or a roadmap that maybe involved you know um fronting or supporting places like pubs and bars and stuff because those things people have said basically that's what's led to some of the spikes right bars and pubs have opened which they probably didn't need to open but they had to open because they was afraid oh if we stay if we stay locked down for a certain pretty long period of time these pubs are not going to reopen ever again right and we're going to lose all these local businesses that are going to obviously affect the overall government the overall country's gdp and then you know no one wants to have that on their resume <coughs> or on their tombstone so why didn't the government work out a plan that involved maybe doing something where they would say hey we're gonna support the catering industry right or um the hospitality industry sorry and we're gonna say hey we can't open you guys up at the moment because we want to ensure that we open up schools first so we're gonna give you this cash give you this float you this money to kind of sustain you until september let's say get put you on lockdown so everyone doesn't go to these places and you know things are back where they need to be and then when we reopen the schools back in september or august or august september we will have a better idea of where we are as a country so then we can maybe start opening up things little by little slowly by slowly but the fact that they opened up pubs and bars and then when they opened them up they told you, you can sit inside which i still for the life of me don't understand right? i kind of thought they were going to just open bars with like limited standing space but they opened pubs regularly um and just had them with tables open which i don't see the sense in that most people that are going to pubs won't have a drink you're not actually going there to sit down and have a meal and if you are you're a psychopath especially during these times that we're living in at the moment um but they did so so maybe that exasperated things maybe that may, maybe that was a switch in people's heads oh it's not a big of a deal um and they were kind of like took their foot off the the gas and didn't really stay in place or you know wear a mask or that sort of stuff when you're in large areas who knows but it, it's just the, the lack of foresight involved with some of these decisions is really really boggling mind-boggling considering everyone knew because now everyone's kind of singing from this hymn sheet oh my god school's so important school's so important if you all knew schools were so important why didn't you have a plan in place to make sure that was the first thing they opened in on mass as opposed to all the other places like gyms and stuff like i could do i love the gym i've been going for the past what two weeks or three weeks since it's been open mostly every single day i love it it's what's been one of my best it's been one of my best um uh, things i've been doing during lockdown at the moment right life is pretty boring without going to the gym it's great it's amazing but i could do it without it if that meant you know kids could avoid going through mental health breakdowns at home because they're not able to kind of you know sign up or i don't know get a place in the university they don't want to go to or just hang out with their friends i'll be okay sacrificing my gym for a child to go back to school it's not that big of an issue but again a lack of foresight now suddenly we're in this position where everything has to open in august and september because they don't want to mess up the dates i guess with the term times and stuff they don't want to push anything back where it needs to be but i don't know about you but i live near a couple of schools and the moment schools reopen because you know I, we know it from like what summer holidays the moment schools the moment kids start going back to school and you start seeing uniforms on the streets you know some of these are over right you kind of gauge when you're kind of the seasons are and the kind of the 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 kind of uh, the vibe of the street the frequency of the street changes considerably so the moment schools reopen and, and you start seeing parents taking their kids to school because you know there's not going to be a parents are going to be um happily happy to let their kids just walk to school on their own they're going to want to make sure they don't touch stuff right and don't contaminate anybody else so there's going to be a lot of parents out on the streets out in their cars taking their kids to school right and all that malarkey so there's going to be increased traffic which is definitely going to mean some people are going to be like you know what this pandemic is over i'm going to go back to normal 
So I don't know, man. There's lack of foresight from the government in general. It's just really bizarre and really makes me wonder what they actually do day to day. Like, what is their, again, like, what is their actual job? Is it just to kind of be good at cutting ribbons, at, you know, when they're opening shopping malls or, you know, you're doing these talking head segments on on the bbc and stuff like what do they actually do because when it comes down to actually providing some assistance some guidance being the adult in a room trying to clarify things they don't have a flipping scooby and they just leave it up to their parents to make the decision and now look if you're a parent and you decide to send your, your kid back to school and your other parent friends don't you somehow look like the the witch the evil witch in, in the crew when you just want to you know your single parent maybe i don't know whatever your situation is you just want your house to be free of children for eight hours in a day that's that's allowed as well you want some selfish time for yourself like but then no yeah you know i mean like it's just such an impossible situation to be in so my heart goes out to all, te all, all parents all teachers and the kids as well You're going through at the moment man imagine absolutely going through it absolutely diabolical but hey what can you do the only other place where there's kind of a little bit more nonsense and where you kind of don't really understand what the hell is going on, nothing really makes sense, has to be America. Has to be. It's probably one of the most baffling places that I've ever kind of uh, come across in my adult life. It, nothing really makes sense, especially when it comes to race, especially when it comes to social justice issue, and especially during this moment in time now where we're in, isn't it, right, where... Um, post George Floyd it feels like racial tensions are an all-time high especially with police um, there's been a resurgence of you know um, just weird racial encounters between certain people it's just a completely weird place to be right so uh, this story broke I guess over the weekend um, let's pause this this story broke I guess over no over the weekend yeah over the weekend I think it happened early, early on Sunday so for some reason, I'm not too sure why, don't ask me, for some odd, odd reason, um, it seems like um, they've learned nothing at all from George Floyd. Zero. They've learned absolute diddly squat. Say what you want about George Floyd, um, whether or not he was a saint or not, the, the, the argument, you know, no one can argue with the fact that he did not deserve to die under those circumstances or in that, or in that way. He, in no way, shape or form did he do anything to deserve the death sentence at the hands of those police officers. That was just completely um, over the top policing, right? We can all agree on that. Fine, no problem. Then obviously the details come out about him as a person, maybe his mental state, whether or not he was drunk and he was high, he was risking arrest, he was the one that actually asked to come out of the, uh, out of the police car because he was feeling claustrophobic and then unfortunately the police in their in their infinite wisdom decided the only way to kind of keep him under control was to lay him on the floor because they felt as if like, he could overpower them whatever disgusting situation horrible he should not have died in the underneath under those circumstances now family has lost a brother a son a husband whatever a father is completely disgusting <clears throat> but you would have thought from the police side of things right from both parties let's let's address both groups you just you would have thought the police in america would have been like you know what we might need to revise how we deal with people civilians right regardless because i think there's so many stories and unfortunately the black lives matter in america has been a bit um weird on that front they they they're essentially turning turning this into like a race war, where they're basically accusing of the they're accusing the police in America of going around lynching and shooting random black people. Which you know there are some occasions of it. Obviously, Breonna Taylor. That's a horrible story where people you know police officers incorrectly burst into her house thinking that she was somebody else and shot her in her own home. Absolutely disgusting. Justice for Breonna. But for the most part, police aren't going around randomly killing random black people, right? Um most most of the if you look at the statistics most of the encounters between uh police and people who are fatally shot they're usually involving some level of crime some level of something right um of course depending on what area you are in america if you're in a very low income area that's not that's majority white you're going to get a lot more police officers killing white civic citizens or you know native citizens and if you are living in an area where there's a lot of minorities obviously a lot of minorities in that area too will unfortunately die if they come into an inter uh, kind of deadly interaction with a police officer that's so that's kind of no one's kind of arguing with that thing but you would imagine on the police side of things they might think you know what we need to maybe relax a bit and not be so uh, trigger happy when it comes to our encounters with civilians we might need to treat them with a little bit more courtesy respect maybe take our job as police as not as kind of you know death sent um kind of you know uh servants of death and instead use our way to kind of de-escalate the situation amicably resolve it in some way shape or form you would have thought they would have a little bit more um caution in how they go about things because again like i said there's many videos out there there's that really heinous video of that kid uh, some white kid somewhere i'm not sure if he's in a hotel an apartment hallway 
a police officer is kind of constantly shouting at him to put his hands up, put his hands on the floor, he lay down, put his hands there, like confusing instructions. The kid gets a bit flustered. He tries to reach for something in his pocket and then the, the police officer kind of unloads, you know, three shots into him, right? And completely and kills him there on the spot. And he had nothing on him, right? It was just like a really bad interaction with a horrible police officer. So you would imagine that the police would be like, you know what, we need to clean up shop. We need to clean house because for sure, in, internally, they know who the bad cops are. Let's get these guys off the street. Let's get them behind the desk so they don't kill anybody. And let's put out a mandate, a kind of closed door memo where we say, hey, if you get into a scuffle with somebody on the street, please, under no circumstances, should your first um, conflict resolution be to pull out your gun and shoot them. Try and resolve it without deadly force. And if it comes to a point where you have to use it, fair enough, but that should be your, your kind of last resort. You would have thought that would be a thing. Then you'd think on the on the people who are, feel like they're getting accosted by black people, by police officers, the most black people in America, you would have thought they'd be a little bit more, um, they'd be a little bit more, there'd be more conversation around how to conduct yourself when you are encountering police, right? To kind of, you know, make yourself as agreeable as possible, listen to their commands, uh, don't make any sudden movements. You would have thought that'd be a conversation too, but it, there's not really that conversation. No one's really having that about how to act around police. But regardless, both parties are not really looking at it honestly. No one's really dealing with it in a great way. And now you're in a situation where another unarmed black man was killed by police, this time in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, the incident looks quite shocking. I don't know exactly what happened. Um, we don't really have any context to the situation, but essentially, I'm not going to play the audio because, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit much. But um, essentially what we see is a video of a guy... Um, being trying to get a well three police officers looks like or two police officers are trying to arrest <coughs> a black guy in a white vest um outside of an suv which might be his car um he's resisted kind of gets away from them he walks around to the passenger seat of his car the police officers follow him from behind he opens a door reaches inside and then as he's reaching inside pistols from behind him shoots him in the back whoops I tell the sound off shoots him in the back seven times it's completely uncalled for right in terms of like as you're looking at it from just our first impressions right but again like i said why would you do this considering the current climate we're in at the moment right record levels of unemployment record levels of people claiming unemployment right um these um what do they call them uh those checks they're sending out aren't gonna last forever people are on their last legs in america i'm assuming healthcare isn't free over there um i'm sure just in general you know there's neighborhoods that are already downtrodden and already messed up prior to covid so imagine what's happening now um really weird relationships with their local police right they've had already instances that they've kind of dealt with and then you put this on top in in this current situation this current climate why would you do this like why it makes no it's just it, and again what it does it invites protests it invites nonsense riots looting all the constant all the kind of usual textbook stuff you're seeing happening now in the states and in parts of europe where as soon as somebody is unfortunately handled the wrong way by police um it gives people with bad intentions an excuse to go out and essentially burn their whole community down to, to the ground and you're seeing that already now at the moment um you've actually got a video here i'm gonna play where is it here of one of the Black Lives Matter, I've guessed a whole group of them decided to go and t and kind of light up their entire local um, car lot on fire, which is just, you know, distressing because at the end of the day, the only people that hurts is themselves. Um, local businesses probably owned by local people um, gone, gone completely up in flames. As you can see per this video here, a car lot is engulfed in flames. Like... And it, it makes you just wonder, like, uh, what is the American police inability? What is with their inability to kind of conflict resolve without deadly force? Why are they unable to do it? Why can't they do it? Especially in that instance. Let's say, for instance, that guy was going in to go reach for a semi-automatic weapon, right? Let's say he was outside the car first, though. His gun was inside the car. So why couldn't they stop him from getting inside the car? Why wasn't one police officer on the other side of the car door trying to stop it? Or when he was walking around the other side, the other one tried to go around. Like, why wasn't there more effort to kind of restrain this dude before, you know, a deadly shooting happened? And if you believe what you read online, supposedly they did try to stop him. This is from uh, a guy here on Twitter who says the following via his tweet get up on here it says cops tried to arrest jacob blake who had a warrant and previous convictions for violent crimes they tried to use a taser blake with guns pointed at him kept walking into his car and reached inside so we know that that has happened right you've seen videos you've seen clips of uh people in the states trying to get well 
uh, as they as 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 they're trying to get arrest as the police are trying to arrest them, they obviously tried to restrain them by you know shooting them with a taser. And some people for some reason I'm not sure if it's like a a strength thing or if you're high or sometimes if they shoot it incorrectly in the wrong place. Some people are able just to kind of withstand it and not really go down in any kind of meaningful way. So I guess in that occasion, police officer has no other opportunity but to pull out his gun. That's why he's got it on his hip. But God damn it, man. You just think there'd be a little bit more understanding and care as to how to deal with this because this is just going to add another, what, two months to the nonsense that's going on already in the States now where they haven't really dealt with COVID well anyway, let alone the riots, let alone police relations, um, let alone the race issues that are already underlying them as a society. Like, it's just... If ever there's a way to really mess up a situation, this is the one, right? America's, like, unique in that regard, right? You're going through a pandemic that requires... Um, people to kind of be, what? How do you say? It? To kind of not put themselves first, right? To kind of think about their neighbor, um, to have a bit of a civic responsibility. That's what a situation that kind of kind of calls for. This is what it means that like you need every citizen to kind of help each other out to make sure this pandemic goes away as soon as possible, right? Or to kind of get it underneath some some level of control. You need your neighbors to maybe help you out with some sugar and some milk on some days when it's tough for you. Maybe you need some parents to maybe help you out or some neighbors help you out in terms of doing play dates with your children, right? This is a time where people should be coming together and really trying to help each other out. But if ever there's a way not to do that, it would be this, right? It would be to have a catastrophe of a police brutality, a catastrophe of a police death, right? At the hands of, you know, what George Floyd suffered, right? A complete catastrophe where a guy that clearly is, you know, a big friendly giant is unfortunately you know, dealt with in the most dehumanizing way possible by police officers. Um, they tried to excuse it. Remember all the kind of smear stories that were coming out about him, which were, you know, wasn't really the point of the matter. And then, yeah, it's just, if ever there's a way to mess things up, this will be it. Like, it's just really distressing, man, to see it all. And, you know, I hope it gets sorted out. I hope they kind of make a solution. I hope they work something out because at the moment, it looks like they don't have a clue what to do in the States. They really don't have a clue, man. It's a really, really sad situation for everybody involved, really. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do I know to sort these kind of things out? It's just funny. You, would, you, just, would, you just would imagine, like, they would, you know, they'd be a little bit more cognitively aware or con you know, is it con what's that whatever that word is of what's going on now and just kind of you know try to appease the community and not be so heavy handed but no 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 interesting way to go about things what can you do next on the list what else do we have here let's go through there blah 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 <coughs> um oh yeah beware of turbo slots <coughs> This is a funny, this is well, not a funny one, but it's a concerning one. The typical is nothing else to talk about. Again, I, I wouldn't really talk about stuff like this, but hey, please bear with me. So I guess these two um, incredibly, act, incredibly um, uh, sexually active young women decided to go on a very popular podcast show called No Jumper, um, hosted by Adam22, and decided to detail their many sescapades. And one girl in particular decided to divulge information that really caught the internet, um, you know, off guard. Um, she decided to let everyone know that she sucked off an entire NBA team and let them finish in her mouth, which is completely disgusting. I'm sorry if you're eating something. And I said that out loud, but the story, you're going to hear the story, actually. So she decided to do that. And yeah, it got people thinking, innit, um, about... Uh, <laughs> How difficult it must be to be a father of a young woman growing up nowadays. Um, again, no judgment on the girl because I guess, you know, she doesn't really look, look as she gives a crap anyway. She decided what she wants to do in her life and this is how she wants to get forward. So, you know, more power to her. Freedom of choice and all that malarkey. But bloody hell. Number one, it's a weird thing that a group, a team, right? Yeah, a team because you're already quite close anyway, right? You already spent a prolonged period of time together, maybe a little bit too much time together. I'd imagine you, you know, at, at, at any time, I'd imagine I played Sunday league football, right? Most of the time, if you spend a lot of time with your teammates, the first thing you want to do when you have a break from your teammates is not hang around with them, right? Or not hang around with some of the guys you don't like, but it, which is, you know, usually more often than not is a, a lot of people. So you might be a couple of people in your group or in your team that you're, you like, that your favorites that you go out with socially, you know, you hang out and you grab a meal together and you go cinema, blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, you don't want to be hanging around with the entire team, right? You kind of 
keep them at arm's distance, go training, play a game, you know, keep the camaraderie up. But then, you know, when you go, go about your free time, you do your own thing. So the curious case for me is that, number one, there'll be a group, there'll be an NBA team that hangs out together socially that would also be comfortable with seeing each other in that kind of position. Like, it's just bizarre. And it must be, again, it must be an American thing because, honestly, growing up, I've, I've been around some really nasty guys and some dudes that are into some questionable stuff. And this was never a thing. Like, guys getting off with girls in the same room. That was always awkward. If it did happen, you just leave, right? And you're at a house party and someone started to hook up in the corner. You just kind of leave or you kind of make sure your back was to it. You don't want to... It's like, it's like seeing someone make out on the train. You don't just stare at them, right? Thinking, oh, if, the, if, if only that was me. No psycho does that for the most part. You kind of, It's kind of a bit of putting, right? Those public spaces of, of affection. Let alone people were actually getting off in a major way like this, right? Like, you know, blowing seven random dudes is not, you know, it's not a snog on the central line. So you can imagine how mad that's going to be. So if, but most of the time when I was in school, honestly, I've been in some weird places, weird situations in my life. If that did happen, you just leave the room. You go somewhere else. Or if you happen to accidentally walk in with when somebody's doing something, you don't just say, oh, can I go next? Like, it's nuts. Even if that person was clearly holding a sign above their head saying, you can go next, you'd leave the room and let the person finish. You wouldn't just stand there and wait around. But I think it's a pretty much an American thing. It kind of reminds you like of a scene out of Blacks or something, right? All those big, burly, you know, massive black dudes standing around like a really petite white girl, right? That's what kind of imagine it makes me sense. But again, I don't, again, like I said, if I've spent this much time around with you in a sporting environment, in a change room, training, playing games, the last thing I want to do is see you butt ass naked, getting yourself sucked off by some random um, girl that you found on Instagram. And I guess this is what happened to her, and this is her story. Like pretty distressing, really, just all, in all in all in all honesty. But God damn it, man, the stuff that goes on out in the streets. My birthday, my birthday is Memorial Day weekend. Uh -huh. On my birthday, I seen them all at Dre's, like this one team. Okay. She's so shy. It's just so cute, <laughs> I know, baby. I'm and I don't know. I was getting fucked. Imagine that's your best friend. That's your coach. That's your like foot coach, isn't it? Your turbo slut. I remember I said something like that as well. When I say something like that, and someone pulled me up on it, oh, actually, she's not a slut. I was like, what? If you're not allowed to call these girls, so, well, I don't think it's an insult to be honest with these girls. I think they're they're you know they um they're owning their they're owning their stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like they're not they're not trying to paint themselves out to be angels but someone trying to tell me off for calling these girls sluts was funny it's like come on man if this is the hill you want to die on god bless you in a hotel room they all put up <laughs> and i sucked their dick but then like down the whole like, team seven seven basketball players in a row mm -hmm. how was that <laughs> i was oh fucked up god. i didn't fuck any of them though she said what happened to the nuts swallowed all of them yeah and nothing happened you didn't have like a, a weird reaction in your stomach or anything no no i passed this sounds so fun you're almost making it sound like you were too fucked up to be sucking. Exactly. What a major story. I passed out. I was so fucked up. I don't even remember. It's like, God almighty. And again, if ever there was, a, if ever there was an instruction or a message to young men out there to just watch your P's and Q's, this was it. Because fair enough, this girl, you know, she, she knew what she was getting herself into. She clearly is about this life, so it's not an issue. But for the most part, most females, I'd imagine, most women, most young ladies aren't this person right or they might do even some girls might even I've, I've been around girls who like to give that impression then when it finally gets to that position they sort of back off like you know they kind of want guys to like them so they kind of play up this idea that they're a turbo slut but they're not really they're a decent girl they just want you to like them if that's the case you have to be able to read and again it's really bad because the the, the kind of the, the game that guys have to play with the the sexual attraction game is just odd and it? it's clumsy but i really do think the onus should be on the dude to read the signs to know that, okay, cool, this girl might be telling me one thing, but she's not really about that life. And if she isn't, it's up to you to kind of pull that cord and be like, hey, I think you're a bit too fast up here. Let me, let me get you a glass of water. Let me get you a drink. Where's your phone? Um, where do you live? Let me get you an Uber. What's your best friend's number? Do you know what I mean? Te let's text them and let them know that you're leaving my place now. Whatever it may be, just so you can put yourself out of harm's way because I don't honestly know what girl would be worth this kind of, tr not trouble, but what girl would be worth getting yourself in this kind of predicament under. Like you get messed up, um, you're drunk, you're high. Because it sounds like she had two sexual encounters. She had one with somebody else and one with a whole team. So imagine you're the first dude and uh, I don't know, I don't know, man. It's just, it scares me. Listen to this stuff. It really does scare me because I think there's a lot of dudes that would that would gl gladly want to put themselves in this position because it feels like it's an easy score. 
but there's also the possibility that you could be with somebody who's only doing that because they want to be down with the click they want to be cool um they want to go back to your room and get some free drinks whatever there's always kind of these you know whatever this person's intentions but maybe their real intention isn't to suck off the entire team maybe their real intention is to maybe just hang out with you or to get, go somewhere warm tonight because they don't have a bed to sleep on there's all these other different um things that play but oh god and seven dicks and also you were getting no. fucked by somebody else right before this yeah they walked in <laughs> mid me getting fucked how did they walk the in where Jesus were you Christ. in the hotel room so i was fucking like someone that works with the team and i know i know that team because i've hooked up with them before the but they team. all pulled up no not the whole team <laughs> okay. like a few of them they all just pulled up they knew i was in there and they were like let's get lit and they were just <laughs> sitting around the bed and they just rotated oh wow. my god yeah. that's tight yo they all love you so you don't Told look back you. do you look back at this as a positive memory yeah i don't care it was lit hell yeah yeah I respect she's that. just nervous right now no, I mean, she's not that nervous if she immediately told us about sucking seven dicks in a row. She's a definition of a bird. Again, I, I don't have any, I don't have any ill will, you know, nothing really bad to say about the young lady. I guess you, everyone makes their decisions, but I just think as young men, you really have to kind of, you really owe it to yourself to be, to have your head in a swivel and to really kind of read the situation for what it is and not for what you want it to be, especially if you're inebriated especially if you're just following your penis around you need to really 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 think deeply about the situation you're getting into especially in the current clan we're in at the moment like you just can't be taking these sort of chances and again i just think in my in my situations i've been in i think more often than not girls like to play up the fact that they are a bit sexually um um what's that thing called uh adventurous and promiscuous and they like to play up that kind of slutty side but really for the most part if they really like you sometimes some girls will do that as a weird way to kind of draw you in which is strange but usually they're not really about that life in most in most okay especially if you try, especially if they require a, a telltale sign if a girl isn't really about her life is if she gets herself ridiculously drunk while you're in the you know swings and throws of your courtship process if she gets really, really high and really fucked up, that's when you know she's not about her life because she's trying to essentially numb herself to get to that point where she feels like she's not going to have any kind of recollection of what's happening because she's going to regret it later on. That And again, that isn't fun. I don't think that's ever... I don't, I don't understand. It's always fun when you're both... Imagine you meet up somebody you're meant to, you're, somebody you're, 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 you've been trying to hook up with for a while. You finally agree to a date. You're hanging out together, and you start the night off trading drinks, having you know having a good time, and you're progressively getting more tipsy together, and you end up hooking up. Cool, isn't it? But one person being completely shit faced, and you maybe not getting to that point, but then using the opportunity to kind of slide into their panties. That's not fun to me. That doesn't really sound like fun. It always it's more fun when you're both you know at that point of ecstasy, no pun intended, as opposed to like you know. Like one person is chasing a idea, a person is like really, you know, it's about to throw up in the loo and then say, no, I'm all right, let's go. It's like, I don't know, man. But yeah, that was a very distressing story and something that kind of just caught me off guard and made me think, why would you, um, I don't know, why as a dude as well, that's another thing. Why as a dude would you um want to be in a room with your friends or getting your dick sucked anyway? Why would you all go together as a group? Like as if you're gonna go, you know, as if they're gonna go on some Magic Kingdom ride or something. Like it's just it's it's all bizarre to me. Again, I've, I've never grown up in that society. I don't know what it's about. These sort of like gang bang things. I don't know what they're about. It's not my vibe. It's not something I've ever been interested in whatsoever. It's just a very bizarre thing. And again, most of the teammates. That's the thing that really makes it weird. You already spend a lot of time together anyway. Why would you want to spend more time with each other in that in that position? Watching us, what like cringe watching your friend flipping it and jacked off like cringe what that actually looks like seeing them kind of you know nut and whatever is that like, yeah i don't want to see that like why like it's just and again like <laughs> like you have to question your sexuality if you're sitting there and then you get hard when your friend's getting something getting off on someone do you have to question that like why are you what are you getting hard from it's all bizarre. It's all weird. It's all weird. It's all so weird. But again, we're living in weird times. Is maybe this is again a consequence of the pandemic? People are just bored. People have been held up at home. Maybe not getting anything. And you know, at any at any point where they can go out and sign and let themselves be free, um, and try hook up with people, they're gonna try and maybe make up for lost time. So if that means seven dicks at once, seven. If it means ten, ten. Whatever it may be, um, and then kind of you know what? I want to see quarantined after this. Oh God Almighty, man! Madness time to madness, isn't it? What can you do? Uh, then I think the same person made a story about Trey Songs pissing on them, which was 
a bit questionable, but I'll probably cover that in another story because I'm, I'm feeling a bit sick from all this stuff. So let's move on from that. Um, another sad one, I guess, in terms of the economy concerning when it, when all things concerning COVID is this story from The Guardian that says we're going to lose maybe 70% of our clubs in the UK if lockdown continues until September or something. Like, just frightening. Again, frightening because there's been no solution. There's been no noise from the government as to what they're going to do. I'm assuming they're probably going to just use whatever idea the nighttime initiative the nighttime whatever organization puts out i think they put out a report or some sort of idea on what they want to do and what they think is a great idea in terms of keeping the nightclubs and the night or the nightlife scene afloat so i'm sure the government's just going to take their plan and just add a bit a bit to it and just kind of roll that out but there's been no hearing we heard nothing from the government about what they're going to do how they're going to support the clubs what the future of the clubs is going to be. There's no, there's been no word of kind of social distance initiative to kind of see if that works. Nothing. We heard absolute diddly squat. And this kind of article from the Guardian confirms it. it says we lost the love. UK nightclubs using COVID to reassess the scene. Um, it says da da da. And this, I think, it's talking about the cause and their new place that everyone's loving for the most part. I've seen on social, but it says the following. It says in front of an old mechanic workshop in Tottenham, a collection of a collection of trestle tables and makeshift bar and a pair of plum trees are being uh, battered by unseasonal downpour as remnants of a tropical storm soak north london the wilted greenery and sudden uh, tables are part of costa del tottenham a tongue-in-cheek temporary outdoor venue in tottenham hell which Stuart glenn and his business partners have created an empty space next to the warehouse uh, uh, when well, the warehouse is their nightclub the cause which is obviously a good little spot. I've seen a few parties actually. There was a cup party on a weekend they did actually at his place. Um, essentially, what they're doing is mostly table service. So there's no dancing. Um, you book tables. I think from two to six or two to six people. I think something along that kind of range. Um, tickets have to be paid for in advance. Contract tracing, all that good stuff. And you know, it's a good way for um them to basically keep themselves afloat, have some income coming in, book some DJs, and um obviously street food vendors, all that good stuff. But of course, you know, they're running at limited capacity. The course probably has five hundred capacity in there alone. They, I think, they bought another space next to it as well. So they're obviously missing out on a lot of money. But at least they have the option to do this. That's already good. Um, and again, it's a great um, kind of initiative they're pushing forward. He says here, wearing a Hawaiian shirt and shorts combination, a fedora and a football scarf. Glenn is not exactly dressed for the weather, but his outfit, outfit, his outfit seems optimi op screams optimism. He and the rest of his um, estimated 1.3 million workers who make a living from the nightlife sector have needed that quality in abundance uh, after COVID-19 abruptly stopped the party in March. He said, we built a whole area not knowing quite what was going on. We adapted and took a whole new team. We went from being a high volume nightclub to suddenly doing table service, which is much be a bit of a freak especially in the uk because table service isn't a big thing here maybe in kind of some glitzy you know soho nightclubs but for the most part there's no table service we don't really run that kind of game so to kind of suddenly shift your model to that is must be weird but again i think it's probably a little bit more manageable to do um more so than kind of running a regular club i'd imagine so i'm not too sure um no for its um righteous club nights such as adonis the causes new because the whole setup is about relaxed socially distanced fun with street food and calmer music we didn't want to be a club with constraints he said which i agree glenn knows he's one of the lucky ones of course had the outdoor space it could develop michael kill the chief executive of the nighttime industries association which i mentioned previously estimates that up to 70 percent of clubs could close by the end of september 70 percent and we've heard nothing from the government zero diddly squat diddly zero from the government which again that's why i have i don't have an issue with some of these promoters who are going out and doing these illegal events now would i go no would i invite my friends to go no if you go will i ever meet you again no but i don't really have a problem with these people putting on their events because for sure for real like if you run a promotions company if you run a nightclub like what the hell are you going to do like really They've given you no idea what's coming, what's coming next, no roadmap, no nothing. And legitimately, the Nighttime Association, Nighttime Industry Association is saying 70% of them are going to close. And they speak to these clubs, yeah, daily. The clubs probably going to them seeking information. It's mad. So on Thursday, the the N NTIA um, warmed over financial Armageddon for its members with 750. 754,000 jobs at risk due to an ongoing uncertainty about nightclubs and venues will be, be able to reopen. According to the NTIA survey, 360 businesses, three quarters um, expect uh, to make at least half of their workforce redundant by September and more than half will not survive more than two months without financial assistance. Kiel said, there may 
there are more than 1,640 1, clubs in the UK. If you take 70% of those away, it's going to be devastating. That's more than true. The heritage has been built over the decades of work and effort, and the government hasn't taken the time to invest, reinvest, sustain, and make sure it's protected. A government spokesman acknowledged it was a difficult time for nightclubs, but said that throughout the pandemic, nightclubs had access to state support, including business rate tariffs, tax referrals, and job retention schemes, and billions in paid loans and grants. But that's not enough, man. And again, not everyone is able to get that. Um, that world's going to run dry sooner rather than later. And again, they have they had no roadmap in place. That, that's, that's the thing. It makes like it's just frightening to see the seventy percent thing. That's the thing that really caught me off guard. Seventy percent of clubs could close by the end of September. It's just insane, man. And again, nothing's been done for it. Um, no idea what to do. And that, not, so that's, you can't blame some of these events, these legal events. You really cannot blame them, man. They're trying their best in these really weird times. Again, I, I just, I just don't know what the way. The, I, I don't know what the way forward is. I would like to see a little bit more. Um, um, iteration going on about social distance raves and events running some trial events here and there asking people to volunteer to go to them maybe i saw some new system that they're kind of using where they kind of have these outdoor spray machine things that they use right where they kind of disinfect people as they're walking in track and tracing of course all that good stuff but do something man give us some hope because we can't be going on living like this man imagine you're a club owner like imagine if you actually opened the club in march what you must be feeling like at the moment imagine just imagine like utterly bizarre man. utterly bizarre um and then it continues um oh this is an interesting one so yeah let, let me react to this this is um dave clark uh very influential techno dj in the scene somebody who was also a great producer and remixer put out a pretty cool statement in terms of um giving his piece or giving his um opinion on these illegal events are happening at the moment there's been a bit of a war between the scene and i guess the business techno people or the wider community at large and the business techno heads there's been an abundance of dj who have who DJs who have basically been flown around uh, different parts of the world to play in to play at questionable events in countries who probably shouldn't be putting on events of this stature some of the djs have been kind of smart enough not to post some of the content of them playing at these gigs but some of these people have been you know um self-absorbed enough to kind of post this content on their feed with no sense of civic responsibility i guess for the current situation we're in at large and just kind of looking after their own pocket which you're meant to do i guess but there is probably wider concerns here than just your ability to play a gig in another country and get some money in your pocket, right? You're obviously going to put other people at risk. So um, Dave Clark gave his opinion on it via Facebook, and I'm going to read you some of his statement here. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Read in four because I haven't actually finished. It says the following. He says, very disappointed in the scene, to be clear. I'm not talking about any DJ that has true financial worries and has to take work. That is their decision alone. However, there are a few top flight DJs who financially do not need the money, but are in the FOMO pact, um, pushed out by their managers, no doubt, and DJing in environments that are far from legal. This is the most interesting part of it. That's something that's really been bugging me. Because I think in the beginning, I was one of these optimists. I was thinking, oh, yeah, when things open up, it's going to mean it's going to be restricted to travel. So all the local scenes are going to pop off. Local communities are going to thrive because they're going to utilize all the local DJs and local artists such as myself. Because I'm, you know, I'm a smaller um, entry level kind of guy operating on my local scene. So I'd imagine, oh, yeah, it's going to give people like myself more opportunity to play because it's going to mean there's less, there's going to be less mid-level to top-level DJs flying in from different parts of the world to come and play. And they're going to utilize their... You you know overabundant pool of talent djs all, all across the uk and in london and europe to kind of make that sustain that scene uh build up where it needs to be and then kind of reinvent it uh in a whole new different light a light that doesn't really rely on top level high ticket selling um artists who basically play the same stuff again and again that's what i would hope to happen but actually what's happened is that the events that have started off first because the promoters don't want to take any risks and they don't want to uh risk put on an event getting all the pa getting get, you know hiring all the equipment um you know being liable for the insurance and all that good stuff and then get somebody that's unknown that can't move tickets they don't want to take that risk so they'd rather book a really high selling artist a high ticket moving selling artist get them over and then take the risk of taking you know the reputational damage on social but at least they're going to be able to cover their initial investment that's what's actually happening and then of course on the other side of it as well the djs themselves who again you can't blame the promoters let's say you know let's make your money if your government says it's safe it's safe that's all you can do 
but it's the DJs too. It's mostly the ones. It's ones that are like you know the ones that travel on private jets all the time. The ones that have like big corporate sponsorships like Porsche and BMW and all this sort of good stuff. Those are, those are the ones that are taking all the gigs at the moment. Now they're the ones that have kind of you know doing those posts where like oh it's five months so since I've been DJing I can't believe my first gig since my, all this sort of nonsense. And it's like huh? If anyone can put up if again not counting anyone's pocket because it's not my business but you would imagine if these guys are getting paid 10 grand plus per set like it makes you wonder what some people do with their money if they're really again maybe it's not maybe they're because i remember someone was saying the other day to me i've got who it was just something like oh these high level djs aren't like normal people right part of their kind of ability to function in society is their ability to go and play places right they can't function without playing a set like someone like a shark the way is basically begging their booking manager to book them as many places as they can book them she wants to work really hard she wants to kind of run herself through the wall she would play just about anywhere as long as they're paying her fee um so for them having to kind of step back and not play it just doesn't compute so they'll just do whatever they can to kind of um go against that fair enough but some of these people are like you know come on like you don't if, if you're if you're if you're like um if you're a card of a low boss, you don't need to DJ anyway. You shouldn't need to anyway. And it makes you question what these guys do with their money. You shouldn't really because it's not your business, but it makes you question it. It says, um, culture from all these um, legitimate clubs, events that close their doors, face hardship by putting forward their own greedy business ethics above all and sundry. Um, those international DJs that do these parties have basically spat on those legitimate industries. They are spat at the backline crew that made them look like a hero. And for what? A successful release sponsored post on social takes uh, talking about how they have missed their gigs. Fucking idiots. This is not over. And they have probably made this their worst they probably made this worse on their watch but hey great gig of course that's that's the thing that's really and i think dax j played recently as well and he's catching a bit of flack not really though let me not say he's catching flack people are catching flack mostly on twitter i feel like on facebook and on instagram on their own feeds people are just happy to have them out again i guess it's because there is a part of me that thinks a lot of these people that go into these events are really having a hard time dealing with the reality that we're in at the moment and if you give them an opportunity to kind of tap out they'll take it and if they see a dj who they kind of represent who's representative of like things maybe getting back to normal or escapism they're just going to latch onto it and say like hey i'm going to ignore all the all the nonsense or the, the reality situation i'm just going to pin my hopes on you so that's why some of the comments on some of these posts especially on you go on dax j's post where he posted about him you know first gig flying three times in a week da, da, da. it's mostly love for the most part unless they're just deleting comments i don't know he says um i would respect them more if they actually were um consp uh, what's that conspiracy thinkers i believe as things stand this virus is real and 5g doesn't look uh, sparrows and made a stupid stand but this is only about the ego and their feet which is true in it if they were conspiracy thinkers that would make it a bit more easier digestible like fair enough they're just kooks that is what it is but it's not it's not like an anti-lockdown rave it's like people raving um in spite of there being a global lockdown and in spite of there being a global mandate not to gather in big large groups of people they're just doing it because they want to do it and because they want to go play out they don't want to be at home especially the ones that have families are the ones you should really question like you must hate your family a lot it's like you know people say about runners like if you run like 50 miles a week right like what you're running away from if you're purposely trying to play now in this current pandemic we're in at the moment and you have no fear of flying you're going to different countries hanging out hugging people you know um not wearing a mask doing all that sort of stuff your fam your your life at home must be really really bleak or you must not like what you've got at home your family your children like it must be really bad um it says yeah i've been watching like many in our industry and what has been happening uh so many coincidences uh in belgium there was a there was a party very near antwerp which sent out an email containing uh whether that word says basically social distancing measures and face masks are not obligatory that's insane then a few weeks later antwerp enters curfew uh, enters into curfew in paris there was some strange parties too yeah possession parties they've not been given the shit now paris has also seen the uptake in the virus and yes of course italy now a big uptake in virus which is which you can't argue against the the science is clear in all these places where they've reopened the clubs and they've reopened places where people can gather in place in large groups and in in large amounts they've kind of had a second spike or they've had like an up an uptick in cases and they've had to close them things again that's that's the fact we can't argue against that so whether or not we attribute it to the clubs to the raves or just to people kind of going out more en masse we don't know but what we know for sure is that once they reopen things and get and they gave people a bit more license to gather in open airs a bit more freely cases went up again um he says here he said we all miss playing but not to play 
But to play these events so as international DJ of repute has put down our industry in the eyes of those that look for any reason not to make it easy. And it's true as well, because I, honestly, I'm into a lot of stuff, right? Like, you know, my, my metal stuff, my indie bands. And I, I can't think of any other scene apart from the electronic music scene or the dance music scene where there are people who are purposely trying to uh, go against the rules to put on events for people. I don't, I can't think of anything. I've not seen any secret indie band gigs. I've not seen any secret um, metal concerts or punk shows. Like nothing. I've not seen anything. The only people that are really trying to push it and trying to make it look like things are back to normal are these high flying. And again, it's the big DJs. It's not the people that are on the bottom or the mid tier who maybe need the money, right? Because essentially, you know, even if you're even if you're playing for a thousand pounds per gig after taxes, after paying your agent and stuff, it's not a lot of money. You're still kind of living paycheck to paycheck, right? And being out of work for six months, regardless of how many thousands you get paid per hour, it's still not going to be enough to sustain you. So I understand, especially if people are living. In country where they have to pay for their own health care cool do your thing but if you're a person that takes a private jet who has a car service who your management pays for your your ground transport and all that sort um you get like it doesn't make any sense you get flown around to fashion weeks like why are you playing now you can chill you can legitimately chill you can chill if you want to so you're clearly playing mostly and again if, if you're playing for the money, then there's already a problem there, isn't it? For sure. But if you're playing to run away from your family, of course, it's a bigger problem. It's like, God damn it, these people. Um, so to these events, um, without doing them properly, I saw one event here in Amsterdam. It was a strange, but done properly. Other clubs like Fuse and Compass have been trying their best to get these strange times and bring some joy in the not ideal circumstances. It's selfish. And please do not see yourself as a legitimate rebel to quote Mike Zaymer. The underground raves in the 90s were a response to an underground movement to spotlight techno and house music because venues wouldn't book it. It wasn't a backdoor way to throw events during a global health crisis, which is true. Quite referencing, quit referencing the past to justify destroying our future you are just doing this for ego whoever's saying that at the moment now is saying that oh this is a we really i haven't seen this but if this is a sentiment going around with some people that oh we're reliving the old school rave scene you're insane that means you haven't done your history you haven't done your homework go and watch some documentary read some books like the rave scene wasn't um a way for it, it, the, the, the rave scene didn't have bloody you know mike don't get me wrong tiesto maybe at his pump might have played in under some underground raves but you know, this isn't a way for Tiesto to play more gigs as like a, a, a political statement. If this is anything but that. Uh, it says, of course, there are inconsistencies in all of this and it doesn't feel fair. But by doing these gigs, give ammunition to authorities to further delay events, which is true. Because they're always, they're going to be the last thing to come back, people, right? Unfortunately, I love going out. I love nightlife. I've been to Bergheim more times than I can count on my both of my hands. But I know and I've resigned myself to the fact that I won't even be able to play a gig let alone go to a rave maybe until next year or until the vaccine has been found. We know that our industry is fucked, right? Until until something changes in terms of this virus, we are in the dumpster as it is. So these events are, if anything, maybe pushing back that date of reopening everything. And again, it's like, you know, it's not... The fair word is a bit cucky to use, but it really isn't fair, is it? Because we all want to party. We all want to go and have a good time. No one wants to be at home, you know, smelling their own farts. We want to be outdoors doing stuff, but we're not. So for you to go out and do it because you want to do it and because you have the means to do it, it's just unfair to everybody else because no one has the opportunity to do that. So to do that, you know what I mean? Um, Excuse me, I said, and now despite feeling pragmatic that perhaps small events could come back this year, I severely doubt if many, if any major festivals will happen within the Central Europe block next year either, which is true because all the events have been postponed until next year, but there's no guarantee that's going to happen, right? How many bloody airlines are closing down and head offices are closing and things are winding down? And I don't know if the insurance companies are going to want to, you know, write off on these things either. And he makes another quote. He says, oh, uh, hardly a word about these things in the main dance press um, happening for like eight weeks now. Yet we have to look at more live versions of the press like NME and talk about Smash Mouth and Chainsmokers. Perhaps some of these ticket sales went through the dance music press. Who knows? Yeah, true. That's a good point. Resident Advisors have been utterly quiet on this regard, which makes sense anyway. Isn't it? They have to kind of look after their, they have to kind of, um, they, they know where their bread is buttered, isn't it? They know where their bread is buttered. They're not going to, they're not going to jeopardize the bag just to kind of make some sort of um, moralistic statement. They're going to pick and choose their battles in that regard. But bloody hell, man what a great response from dave clark and again echoes a lot of the thoughts i've been having concerning the situation ba, 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 ba. next on it what else is who else spoke about this um yeah responding to rebecca she made a post as well which you know 
bit wafty, made no sense really. It's a bit silly. Um, I don't know. I guess some of these people just feel guilty and they want a kind of virtue signal and kind of make people know, hey, look, I'm not a bad person. I'm, I'm still, I'm still kind of um socially or consciously aware. It's like, look, if you're gonna go play, go and play. You know what I mean, don't give us some long essay and sob story about you deciding to go play. And again, I like Rebecca. I fuck with her productions. I like her her DJing style. But get over yourself a little bit, innit? So this is a post from her. It says, I wanted to write a post. Um, as I'm really torn between um, what's appropriate for DJs to be doing right now during the pandemic. I played last month in Zurich, as you know. They explained that the capacity was capped at a third of the regular attendance. They had a track and trace and a sign at the door. They seemed like the government had an adamant um, that they were going to allow these clubs to open and to get the industry back up and back up uh, and running. Some cases went back up in, a, in the first few weeks, which was associated with a house party gathering and actually not inside the venue. Two weeks before my gig there, each country is trying different things, step by step, trying to find some normality and of course help an industry that is in dire need of losing venues, as losing venues and jobs is now becoming a reality. So what's everyone's thoughts on this? Should we be completely free for the foreseeable future? Should we be completely club free for the foreseeable future? Or should we be socially experimenting here? Do we run the risk if we keep all the clubs close of illegal parties happening more and god knows another horrendous outcome that happened in the uk takes place again i am now in full transparency heading to Guyo in hungary i like a full brand transparency this is again this is a, an opportunity for it to like say hey guys it's like when you put up um it's like when you write black lives matter on your instagram profile it's, you're sort of like hoping no one comes and comes on your profile and trashes you right you're like hey guys leave me alone i'm a good person i like black people I, I like that new Drake record, right? <laughs> That's what she's done here. Because she, <coughs> she's been transparent. And then another gig in Hungary. Another one in Hungary for a last minute gig. Oh, last minute. I researched intensely and the cases of the virus are low. The clubs have been open since the end of June and no case is coming from the clubbing age group and industry. Please let me know your thoughts below. It's like, okay, get over yourself. Anyway, first things first, Zurich isn't an issue. We've seen loads of DJs playing. I think bloody, is it Luciano has a residency in this nightclub that they're, they're talking about? I think it's the same one. I think it's capacity 500, maybe plus, but they've capped it at 300. They've obviously done everything they can do to make it as safe as possible. The economy has opened up. The government's already allowed those places to open up. So if the government says, yes, you can open up clubs in places like Switzerland that have dealt with the coronavirus a bit, uh, a bit better than some other places, then fair enough, go and play. No problem with that whatsoever. And these places are obviously picking some of the bigger DJs to go playing because it makes more sense that they book like a Rebecca, somebody of her level, uh, for maybe a, a lesser of a fee. Maybe I'm not too sure if, if they're paying the same fee, but let's say they're not. Let's say it's just an opportunity to, to book them because maybe she wouldn't be available during this time of year usually. They're gonna take a bunch of it. I don't have any problem with it whatsoever. Do is that a bra in her as a face mask? I don't know. Well, yeah. Do what you want. Is regard especially in that regard. You can do as you please. The issue people have is with these other parties that are happening that are not socially distanced. They're not done in a country where they're permitting people to gather in large groups of people. And they're obviously done um like to skirt all the kind of regulations, all the rules. That's what people are that's what people are annoyed by because if anything, you're putting other people at risk, you're putting yourself at risk, and you're gonna leave everlasting damage that you're not gonna be anywhere near to kind of feel the consequences of because you're coming in, flying in, doing your gig and leaving, and you're gonna leave a whole trail of of destruction. That's the issue. It isn't you playing in countries where they're permitting clubs to reopen. That's okay. Go make your money, do your thing. Or you know, even the money thing, because the money thing gets a bit weird too, because people it feels like there's a bit of jealousy involved as well. Some people are like, hey, why are they making money going to play? Look, it's we all know these people make money. This let's not be under any illusions they're making money they're doing their thing it would have been nice for this to have been an occasion for these promoters to maybe utilize their local um, address book of djs and maybe prop up the local community and local scene and you know give these djs an artist and chance to play in these venues we should, that would have been lovely but i want to understand because i've been a promoter myself that sometimes if you want to take the risk of you know hiring a place especially during the pandemic put up the money to rent a place renting a sound system hiring your own security maybe you're paying more for security all these risks that you're taking you don't want to then take another risk with a lineup you want to guarantee that lineup is going to sell tickets now in my thinking i would assume that because no one's partying and everyone's desperate to go outside that it doesn't matter who you book usually at a nightclub like if i booked if i booked my if i played all night long at fold i still think i could pack that place you know wall to wall 
I don't think I could, I'll lose a crowd. I think I could probably hold it down for the majority of the hours that it stayed open. I'm pretty sure I could do that. I don't think it matters. I think if you're competent enough of a DJ, you could probably do a good enough job to sustain people's interest, um, to keep the club going, keep people buying drinks. It's not really an issue because I think people are so desperate to go out now. But I also understand if you're not a club owner, you're just a promoter putting on events that you don't want to take that risk. You want to just pick the big people who you probably won't get a chance to book uh, um, any other time apart from this. You want to make a bit of history, put it in your... Um, uh, put it have have it stuck in your archive as oh we had this person play at this really janky event that we put in this middle of the bushes and then kind of you know build that relationship blah blah i understand what the risk they're taking but i think as a dj to kind of virtue signal and be like hey guys i'm i'm a bit worried it's like get over yourself do you know what i mean zurich is open hungry is open go play a thing do your do your occasion people are just unhappy about the raves that are happening in places where they shouldn't be happening that's basically it on that one then um oh yeah and then lastly talking about raves that shouldn't be happening oh shit oh no what's happened there yeah talking about raves that shouldn't be happening we've got this interesting one right um because i think i've spoken about this a few times here and again like it's hard to kind of have an honest opinion about it because sometimes i watch these videos i'm like you know what i am jealous as f so possession paris possession techno parties this um, ragtag group of kids who go around and put on these really cool um, open air techno parties in the outskirts of Paris, putting another event over the weekend where they had um, a few of their residents playing, basically some friends and family, and it went off. It looked fucking amazing video wise, right? But there's been no, there's been a bit of pressure, a bit of backlash on social, it feels like. So I think most of the DJs were wearing a mask, so they tried to go around that. And obviously, with them being open air parties, um, there is this assumption that hey it's a lot more safer to do those than to go and play in a nightclub right this idea but it's really reckless it's really careless but a part of me is so jealous that I won't be able to go myself like I wish I had the kind of reckless abandon to leave my home jump on a Eurostar for 100 quid because Eurostar tickets aren't that expensive at the moment uh, hop on a train and go and attend this party because it looks so much fun so I went on Instagram I scraped all these different accounts of people that uploaded videos on there. I put it into a little YouTube video, uploaded it, and I'm going to play a bit of here in the background. And I don't know about you, but it looks like fun. It looks like pure and utter fun. And, and again, this is what, this is what, um, this is what my optimistic idea about Corona post coronavirus parties is going to be like this idea that basically, you know, for the most part, you know, possession as a concept, they do go out their way to book their friends and family. They do go out their way to book local um, or, you know, local or, um uh domestic artists and they're trying to prop up this the techno scene in france or in paris in general i uh, try and give those guys a platform you know it's a very open space right they're very lgbtq friendly they want to provide a, a safe place for people to go and dance and hang out if you've seen some of the events they do with boiler room the vibe is amazing it reminds me of like the glory days of greece Müller, right it's a really conscious effort to make this event more than just like getting good years to play it's about the community it's about the scenes it's about the vibe so it's no surprise that once they do the same event outdoors especially during these crazy times where people are a bit uncertain and they want a bit of respite and they want to go out and be free and have a bit of escape this is going to be the result and it's bloody fantastic it looks absolutely unreal i'll play a bit of the video for you now but it looks like so much fun and again i wish i could hate i wish i could say i don't want to go wish i could say that it's a bad idea but god damn it god damn it i would go in a heartbeat That looks fun. That looks fun. I don't care. I'll put it up again in the settings. Daytime dancing. Oh yeah, and by the way, look at the difference in the scene. Like if you and again, I think I mentioned it previously somebody else, right? But if you're gonna go out, right, and you're gonna go see a DJ play somewhere, don't go see Nina Kravitz twirl around her hands and you know whatever, right? Or whatever else person. Go to an actual rave. Like, if you're going to break lockdown rules and you're going to go against um, the government guidelines, uh, yeah, whatever it may be, this is the way you should do it. Actually raving, for real. This is what you should be doing. Actually raving. Not just standing there recording a video of somebody that you could see any other time of the year. Like, why would you waste your time doing that? This is, what, this is actually worth going out.
And I think, because um, I've watched quite a few of their videos and I think the DJs made a really concentrated effort to put on a mask on, so that was a good one. But look how fun this looks. They have the best residents as well. Like, badass, man. Of course, Anita's probably the best, the most famous one, I guess, from the crew, but so good. That's what I miss the most, man. Look at that. Look how fun that looks. Oh my god. And it really puts it, and it really put it, sorry, it, it really puts into can it really puts it into um perspective how crappy like because I've, I've been going to pirate studios a few times to record some sets i've actually done a couple of dj sets i record that i'm going to upload onto my instagram um, to our youtube story so watch that out watch out for that um give you an idea on the kind of stuff that i play and stuff and obviously prepare some mixes i'm going to be standing at the places where i want to go and do some dj mixes and dj streams for but you know you try and make that thing fun you bring some drinks hang out with some friends use your little mixing thing it's you know it's a boogie but it can never replicate a rave. It can never replicate, you know, hanging about with like random strangers, rubbing shoulders, exchanging sweat, funny glances, you know, pupils dilating. It can never really uh, replicate that. It can't. This is just the beauty of the rave is the rave. <laughs> Everyone's dancing. There's some recording on the phone, but for the most part, everyone's dancing. Look at the difference of this. Look at the difference. It's incredible, man. The music played is far more interesting too. Not just the usual fucking people top 50. People are calling Anita wifey and stuff. And they don't get much backlash either, it looks like. I'm not too sure if it's because they don't really say stuff on social. They're a bit, you know, they just post about themselves and music and keep it moving. But there's not much backlash I've seen of these DJs as well playing there. Online, anyway. Look how fun that looks, man. No, that's such a vibe. Such a vibe. And yeah, I'm jealous, man. I'm really jealous. I'm really jealous. And again, I can't... So good. Look at that. Kids going for it, raving. And, and again, I don't know, man. Like, uh, what would you guys do? Again, in my, in, in my case, you know, I'm not going out anywhere, but would you go if something like this happened near where you live? Like, an actual proper rave, not just booking, you know, glitzy DJs, actually booking local artists that are killing it in your scene. Um, you know, everyone's comfortable, right? It's um all it's um it's all inclusive, right? In terms of that regard, right? There's not many lads and that kind of energy there. Would you go? Would you take that risk and go somewhere like this? And again, I don't have any uh, anything bad to say about DJs playing there because they're like you know they're like mid level people. Right? I'd say even, maybe even just up lower mid level, right? They're probably been greatly affected by COVID more so than most, right? They're literally down to their last penny. Um, I'd imagine some of these people probably haven't had haven't had a normal jobs since they've been DJing, or the DJ has been their only job. So to try and go from that to working in a supermarket is like, how would you even go get that job? Because you've got no experience. That's the issue too. I think a lot of it. A lot of these DJs that are complaining about oh, or virtue signaling online, they should just go out and just get a regular job. But some of them don't have any experience, so I don't even know how they're gonna. Especially if you're comp like, there's people that have been working in offices that are struggling to get retail jobs. So imagine if you're a DJ, how hard it is to you to get a job. So I don't have any anything wrong to say anything bad to say about anybody going out and getting away he's trying to keep food on the table keep roof over their heads but again i just think to myself like there is a part of me that's like could this just be could you just wait off on this as fun as it does look can we not just all wait until everything is settled down and we can all go out and rave because we're all gonna when stuff is reopened we're not gonna stop raving we're gonna be you know i'm gonna get fucked for like a month straight right back to back i'm sure people are gonna do the same thing so there's no real need to kind of push it now because you're going to go hard when re stuff reopens. And there's going to be so much stuff open at the same time. Because they're going to try and make up for lost time anyway. As you are. Um, I don't know man. Let me know in the comments down below. What do you think? Is this a good idea? Bad idea? Do you understand? 
or are you really annoyed by it? I'd imagine so, if you, especially if you've got a family member that's been affected by it, you probably don't have any patience with this at all, no level of understanding. I completely get that. But yeah, interesting situation to be involved in. Again, I'll put the link down below to show you so you can watch it below, but it's on my channel. It's called Position Techno Paris 2020. I mean, or the date 220, but I'll put the link in the show notes for you guys to check out. Anyway, that has been the Agassino Zinger Show, episode number 359. I'll end it there as it's been an hour and a bit. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. Um, again, if you want to support the show, make sure you do. If you click the Patreon link down below, patreon.com forward slash Agostina. Click that and support the show. Also, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast um, app, make sure that you leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. And of course, if you're going to follow me on Instagram, there'll be a link or there'll be a little thing that'll pop up there. You can follow me on there. Follow me on Twitter as well. That'll pop up too there. And yeah, keep in touch in it. And I'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe and hopefully by next time i have a haircut right should i have a haircut maybe i will maybe i won't i don't know but regardless take care be safe see ya bye